to you. This is so awesome. It's a full house, gentlemen. I think that you did it, so good. thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming back, for tuning in on Zoom during this really challenging time. But we're so thrilled to have our friends and our thinkers and our citizens with us. So good evening. For those of you who hadn't had a chance to say hello to, I'm Jennifer Rabb, and I have the extraordinary privilege of serving as president of Hunter College where I am proud to report the American dream continues to come true. That dream is fully reflected in Hunter's longtime college motto, Nihi Cora Futuri, the care of the future is mine. But as we all know, preparing for the future requires understanding the past and learning from it. History might not completely repeat itself, but it does echo. And the wisest of our leaders and citizens are those who remain alert to those signals. Just five days ago, we marked not only the holy days, but also the 157th anniversary of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. That tra shocking tragedy shook the country on Good Friday and in the midst of the Jewish observance of Passover. So it powerfully reminded Americans of the sacrifice often required to achieve liberty, but it also demonstrated that it's sometimes harder to win the peace than to win a war. As our two guests this evening know all too well, few events change American history more profoundly. Just five years after Lincoln's untimely death, an Irish immigrant educator named Thomas Hunter founded what would be called then, soon after, Hunter College, making sure that it would offer admission to students of all races, religions, and backgrounds, with black students sitting alongside whites and Christians sitting next to Jews. That's the good news. Yet, before the school was just a decade old, America had abandoned Reconstruction and turned its back on the premise of freedom and unity, the sacred cause for which the bloody city war, civil war had been waged. And that's the haunting story that brings us together this evening. Over the last seven years, as I'm sure many of you know, Roosevelt House has been host to a number of Lincoln-themed public programs, both in person and online. Now, that focus may not be central to our original mission, and we are, of course, of course, called Roosevelt, not Lincoln House. Um, but I guess it's part of the deal when you hire one of the most esteemed Lincoln scholars to be the director of Roosevelt House. And that's what we did, of course, in bringing Harold Holzer aboard in 2015, the year he won the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. Besides, as Harold likes to remind us, FDR actually was a huge Lincoln admirer. He closely studied his presidency and quoted him frequently during the Depression and the run-up to World War II. FDR even gave his own Gettysburg Address, which unlike Lincoln's, Roosevelt actually wrote on the train to Pennsylvania. Harold will probably be able to tell you more. And as Harold's onstage partner has reminded us with his latest book, Roosevelt worked hard to emulate not just Lincoln the warrior, but Lincoln the peacemaker. And that's the storyline they are set to explore here tonight. Last February, though we were locked down and exclusively on Zoom, we welcomed both of tonight's guests to Hunter to talk about the CNN documentary series on both, which both of them appeared about Abraham Lincoln. Tonight, we welcome back the dynamic duo to hear the discussion in person. And of course, to our Zoom audience, welcome as well. The occasion for the reunion is the publication of John Avalon's brand new book, Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, a study that takes a fresh look at the commander in chief who waged a costly and relentless war with one eye fixed on a future he hoped would reflect malice towards none and charity for all. It's a neglected story, but one that future wartime presidents, FDR included, would keep in mind as they planned exit strategies and surrender terms of their own. And it's such a delight to welcome the expert who has connected these dots so effectively, our good friend John Avalon, senior political analyst and anchor for CNN, who appears every weekday morning on the must-see wake-up show, New Day, with his brilliant and often biting fact check on American politics. This week, in addition, he's been anchoring that early show. So John, I don't know if I should get you some coffee because I think it's probably your bedtime. Um, <laughs> John served five years as editor-in-chief of the Daily Beast and has simultaneously etched a major reputation as a historian. His previous book, 
Washington's farewell, the founding father's warning to future generations was both a popular and critical triumph. His earlier books include the prophetic volume, Wingnuts, How the Lunatic Bridge is Hijacking America. John's latest effort has received the same glowing notices John always attracts. Ken Burns called Lincoln and the fight for peace a stunning accomplishment and an essential reminder that the Civil War, the most important event in our country's history, is very much a part of who we are as a people and a nation today. The New York Times added, Avalon makes the retelling affecting and powerful. John, this is actually your third time with us at Roosevelt House. You joined us in 2020 to interview Harold on his last book, The Presidents Versus the Press, and then returned in 21, as we said, to talk about the CNN series. And now we have the pleasure of turning the spotlight on your new terrific book. You and Harold have been in public conversation so often, we're beginning to think you're auditioning for co-anchoring spots. So maybe we can find an all Lincoln show on cable, it will all work out. <laughs> Whatever happens, we certainly invite you to keep auditioning at Roosevelt House and think about coming back to speak also to our students. Leading the conversation, of course, tonight is our own Harold Holzer, the Jonathan Fenton Director of Roosevelt House. Harold has produced an amazing total of 54 books on Lincoln and the Civil War, and I just want to let everybody know, in case you're anxious, he's working on number 55. <laughs> He's won so many awards we would be here all night talking about them, including the Presidential Award for the National Endowment of Humanities from the real president, Barack Obama, and most important to Hunter College. He's been serving as Roosevelt House Director for nearly seven years. John, Harold, as you've both shown us and as recent events in Afghanistan and Ukraine so powerfully and tragically remind us, there are no subjects more urgent and relevant than the danger of war and the quest for what Lincoln called a just and lasting peace. We're just proud and grateful to have you both here at Roosevelt House to take a new look at that perennial and perilous challenge. Please join me, everyone, in, join in welcoming Harold Holzer with John Avalon. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you. I just have to say before we start, it's so amazing to look out at you and see a full house back at Roosevelt House. Humans, <laughs> New Yorkers. But I, w I, w I just want to take one second to say that for nearly two years, the glue that held us all together and pushed us to be online, to be, um, I was going to say bipolar, uh, the <laughs> thing where you, where you have both <laughs> online and Zoom. <laughs> but the inspiration and the force behind our continuing to serve you during these two years is President Rabin. I just want to thank her for doing that. So it, it's been pretty intense because wars are going on that weren't going on when you conceived this book, right? Afghanistan is over. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, Ukraine is in play. Um, why did you decide, after Washington's farewell, to do this particular book? Well, you know, Washington's farewell was about Washington's warning to future generations about how our democracy could be derailed. And the chief themes were hyperpartisanship, foreign wars, foreign uh, involvement in our elections. So, you know, he hit a lot of basic themes. <laughs> Lincoln is, I think, the next logical figure because, of course, he inherits the presidency at a time when those worst fears are all coming to fruition. And it's, it's the lessons of his leadership that I think help us through. But th the second layer to the book is really this question of how you win the peace. And uh, I think it's something that we have struggled with as a nation in, in recent years. Um, and, and the seed of the book really came years ago, maybe more than a decade ago, when I found a quote from General Lucius Clay, who was the American general who ran the occupation of Germany after the Second World War. And it turns out he was a son of the South, grew up in Georgia 30 years after the Civil War. His dad was a, a senator. And someone asked him, what guided your decisions during this occupation? And he said, I tried to think what Abraham Lincoln would have done for the South if he had lived. And that was so profound to me and so unexpected. And it, it offered that, that portal that I love where the past and the present and the future all collide. Uh, and in that, I saw the, the, the seeds of a book where you could not only trace 
the story of Lincoln's leadership in the final days in office, the final six weeks in office, but then the afterlife of his idea and how it is ultimately successfully implemented in the wake of the Second World War. Um, and that's what I did. And, and by the way, he, as you point out in the book, I didn't even know this. Um, he was a descendant of Henry Clay's as well, right? Who was Lincoln's ideal politician. There's so many weird cross-pollinations. Yeah. I mean, like a, a descendant of Je uh, Confederate General Jubal Early is FDR's press secretary. Sumner Wells, who was working up here, is a non-linear descendant of both Charles Sumner and uh, Gideon, Gideon Wells, yeah. the, uh, the naval secretary. Yeah, these, these, th these are just the grandchildren of the Civil War are the ones who are presiding over the nation during the Second World War. So there's a lot of overlap. So about eight score years ago, right, <laughs> Lincoln was So you murdered. do that all the time? No, I just, I just thought of okay. it. <laughs> Didn't even write that down. And all the plans for peace are, you know, set, are, are no longer operative because there's a new, there's a new unexpected accidental president. Mm. How do you calculate that Lincoln's loss by violence affected the plan for reunification that included reconciliation, not just between the sections, but between the races? Oh, I mean, fundamentally. I, I, I think we don't, we don't study Reconstruction enough as a nation, and in some ways we're still coming uh, to, to grips with it. But, but now we probably can't in most states. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was dark. Uh, <laughs> Um, I think, but it, it, it actually, to, to, to underscore your, your serious point, it's exactly why we do need to understand our history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We shouldn't be afraid of celebrating the good, we shouldn't be afraid of confronting the bad, and also looking squarely at the ugly, because that's how you learn what went wrong. I mean, part of the reason I love applied history, which is what I tried to write, is it's about useful wisdom. It's a great story. But it's also, it's useful wisdom. What can we learn about the leadership of Lincoln? What can we learn about the mistakes we made in the past? And the way we went off the Lincoln path during Reconstruction, the way we effectively lost the peace, not completely, but largely, by sacrificing uh, emancipation and the legacy of, of, of racial reconciliation for reconciliation among whites in the North and South is so instructive. The mechanisms by which that blacks were, black Americans were denied their rights despite three constitutional amendments. Right? Even a constitutional amendment isn't enough to guarantee without the force, without enforcement. And, and that's why when you look at this, how that was done, a combination of voter intimidation, voter suppression, election subversion, <laughs> you need to pay attention to those forces. And that doesn't mean we're always, you know, you need to, you we're dealing with Jim Crow 2.0 per se, but as I think Jennifer referenced, you know, as Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, but sometimes it rhymes. <laughs> and so it's useful to listen to the echoes and to understand the legacy and how we lost the peace and how segregation replaced slavery for a generation and how that fundamental resistance to majoritarian and multiracial democracy is so deeply ingrained in our country. Um, and, 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 and you need to learn the history and, and, and apply the lessons so we're not doomed to repeat it. So it's fundamental. The, the, I think there's no question in my mind that the assassination of Lincoln is probably the greatest trajectory changing moment in American history. And the fact he's replaced by Andrew Johnson is, is a reminder that character is the single most important quality in a president, among other things. But <coughs> it's also instruct an instructive warning about the casualness with which some vice presidents have been chosen. And you know, FDR may have lucked out when he casually decided that Henry Wallace should be succeeded by oh. Harry Truman. But <laughs> I mean, but um, this was m maybe one of, if you can find Lincoln's fingerprints on the nomination, which is hard to do. It's a, it's a it's a, it was a terrible mistake. It it was, um, and, and it's funny. I mean, you know, if you want to imagine the Cold War with Henry Wallace, that's a whole nother alternate history <laughs> you can do all day long. But but. You know, it's very forgivable and understandable in the context of its time, right? There's no American president who's been assassinated, although Lincoln had a whole drawer full of death threats uh, in, in, in his White House office. Um, you can understand that, you know, he the balance between Hannibal Hamlin and Lincoln was an east-west balance for this new upstart, effectively third party, the Republican Party. And then they are rebranded in 1864 as the National Union Party. 
And it makes sense then that he's going to try to balance the ticket not west-east, but north-south. And Johnson, to his credit, is the only Southern senator who refuses to secede with his state. He's a war Democrat. He says treason must be made odious. And in fact, all the radical Republicans thought he would be better for Reconstruction than Lincoln. But Benjamin Wade actually is wishing, days before Lincoln's own assassination, said, you know, I hope Lincoln is assassinated because Johnson will be better. He will be tougher on the South. He did say to enslaved people in Tennessee, I will be your Moses. Yeah. And um, something happened. Well, I, and, and, you know, when actually <laughs> Frederick Douglass speaking, uh, I believe at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, referenced that speech, and he said he, he's promised to be our Moses and ended up our Pharaoh. I, <laughs> I, I think that the key point beyond character, um, and he is the opposite of Lincoln, I think, in all things except humble birth. And Lincoln did have a particular weakness, I think, for people he'd known during his one term in Congress. He took a lot of comfort from that familiarity. Um, although he was also furious when Johnson shows up drunk at inauguration uh, and, and doesn't really forgive him. Um, but you to know, his credit, Johnson said, I don't want to come to the inauguration. I need to stay in Tennessee. And Lincoln said, get your behind here to Washington. That's not how we do things, and, <laughs> and regretted it. I don't know if you knew that story. I do know that story, but I, I always wondered about that. And I certainly don't think you can blame Lincoln's insistence that he arrive at his own inauguration on him being drunk. But, um, but, but you know, it, it's, I found this, this quote about Johnson in the Atlantic Monthly uh, at the time, early in his presidency, where it says, he is egotistic to the point of mental disease, <laughs> thin-skinned and vain and resentful. Um, and, and, and if you just look even close focus, I mean, the way he orders black troops out of the South, vetoes the Civil Rights Bill, tries to, you know, dismantle the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, I mean, you know, he is motivated by his bigotry in fundamental ways. He allows the black codes to be put in place. I didn't fully appreciate this. By, by basically the late summer and fall of 1865, the black codes are beginning to be put in place. And, and you know, which is basically just slavery without the chains. I found a speech by a, a Mississippi Brigadier General who's effectively acting as governor of Mississippi. And he says, look, slavery's over, we have to accept that, but it doesn't mean we have to accept equality. And so we'll do this and pass all these laws. And, and Johnson acquiesces. So I, J Johnson is hugely to blame. And what is it, just, uh, we'll leave Johnson in a second, but I can't help observing that when he was impeached, um, what did he do? He did a series of rallies. He loved rallies. One, he, one called of many it the, he called it the swing around the circle. Yes. And, but there were rallies all over the country, and big, big rallies. Mm -hmm. Okay, enough of, enough of that. But let's go back a step. It's basically um, just guys nerding out about Lincoln right. in front of you all for your amusement side. I wish I could see many of them and what their expressions are, but it's maybe better to Amusement. be. Amusement. Yes, I hope so. Um, Lincoln is commander-in-chief when more American soldiers and civilians die than in any other conflict in American history. So you are requesting us to, uh, to pursue a leap of faith that a man who was a relentless warrior, mm -hmm. you know, interested in new weapons, deadly weapons, um, was also, should also be remembered as a peacemaker. How how does he how does he pursue both? Because that's the key to the book. It is the key. By to the, the way, I do know the answer to all these questions, I, I, but I want everybody else to hear them. <laughs> no, I know it from reading your book. You're the one. I didn't say. I didn't mean that. I knew it before. I, John makes I some think great. You did. Can, no, I don't. I didn't. I don't mean to say that. He makes some fabulous connections in this book, which I had never thought of. So I do want to. Well, that's that. that's a compliment, and I appreciate that. No, I mean, that, that is part of the extraordinary thing about Lincoln. He is determined to win the war. I mean, he goes through five generals because he keeps insisting they'd be more aggressive. But he is thinking, early in the war, he is thinking about how you reunite a nation. I mean, that's what's so extraordinary. He un his key insight, it seems to me, is that in a civil war in particular, and there's never been a civil war on this scale before, so there's no historic figure he can draw on, that if you don't win the peace, you don't really win the war. Because in a civil war, you can't simply pound your opponents into submission and salt the fields. You need to find a way to live together again. And, 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 and so he's thinking about this. You look at what he does in 1862, as early as 1862, some of the darkest days of the war, working with the Republicans in the Congress to create an economic structure 
talk about a leap of faith, that would move the nation's attention westward with a spirit of economic expansion. Transcontinental Railroad Act, the Homestead Act, land-grant colleges. He's setting forward a structure to move the nation's energy and attention west because he understands that you know, you're going to need that spirit of investment in a shared prosperous future to get over the, the wounds of war. So he does it through policy. He does it through, I mean, you can see his statements, whether it's the presidential proclamation from December 1863 where he lays out his vision of reconstruction, to his comments, you know, his, his repeated message to General Sherman and Grant and Porter in City Point uh, in, in the famous painting, The Peacemakers, which captures a real meeting on the River Queen, which was kind of the aquatic Air Force One of, of the day, <laughs> where he says, you know, give them the most liberal and honorable terms. Let them have their guns to go home and shoot crows with and their horses to plow the fields with. Give them the most liberal and honorable terms. But he's talking about the Confederate rank and file. He wants accountability for the people who should have known better. You know, the members of Congress, the courts, the military, the people who had spurred secession. He did not want them to get amnesty right away. Now, he wasn't going to kill them, which is the traditional punishment for treason. But he was very clear he didn't want them to simply reclaim their power. That was what was not called reconstruction, but restoration. Um, so he has a very detailed plan. Um, and, and in fact, the last speech of his life is, is a fairly legalistic speech. Everyone was expecting a big triumphal address for celebrating Lee's surrender at Appomattox, but he lays out sort of principles for guiding reconstruction. And it's a, it's a fairly decentralized vision. So in his speeches, in his writings, beginning early on in his letters, um, you can see he is developing a very clear philosophy of how you win a peace after winning a war. And I think it can be distilled to unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. By the way, in that last speech, um, there was one uh, bit of federalism that Lincoln introduced, mm -hmm. and that's the idea of granting the voting rights to people of color. Mm -hmm. No American... Pre and I actually, he proposed it in a very limited way. The very intelligent and those who have served in the military. So, you know, looking at it from the 21st century, it looks like means testing and, you know, the, the restriction. But it was novel enough, it was extraordinary enough for someone in the audience, John Wilkes Booth, to say that's the last speech. This means Negro equality. Mm -hmm. And he didn't use the word Negro. And that's the last speech he'll ever make. Now I'll put him through. So there was that element also. 100%. I mean, he, he, he was always walking that line. You know, he was a reconciler in a time of radicals and reactionaries. But you, know, you also mentioned black Union soldiers, and I will say that is one of the most important, most underappreciated aspects of the war. 180,000 black Union soldiers helped turn the tide of the war. 25 won the, national, the Medal of Honor. And they are really written out of our history. But that their contributions were essential to turning the tide of the war. They deserve to be much more focused on their stories told and celebrated. Things like the fact that uh, the black regiment led the, 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 the Union troops into Richmond after its abandonment by the Confederates. And then we're told to stand aside at the last minute. And so Charles Charleston, too. Yeah. They're, they're just story after story. But, but I, I, they are transformative heroes of, and, of American history. And a higher, history. higher casualty rate than, of course. than white troops because they volunteered to go first at, you know, um, Fort Wagner and other places. Sure. So last week, um, a really terrific historian named Carolyn Janey won the Lincoln Prize for a book in which she argues, I'm beginning to have like new thoughts about it, in which she argues with, with really good case studies that the, uh, the peace achieved at Appomattox or the cessation of hostilities achieved at Appomattox was not quite as clean uh, as we have been led to believe. And she cites incidents of soldiers not picking up their proper paroles, abusing black people as they headed back home. But in the end, watching how wars end, um, and she wrote this book before Afghanistan. She said so in her speech. It's kind of remarkable that it ended as quickly as it did. And... Um, Lincoln deserves some credit for that because, as you say, on the River Queen, um, he made it clear he wanted the actually he wanted the leaders to escape unbeknownst to him. I love that story. It's a great story. Yeah, no, it, it, and 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 just also it's worth noting that I mean Grant's 
terms of surrender to Lee at Appomattox um, are, are basically dictation, you know, taken from his mind from his conversations with Lincoln over the last previous few days, including around an hour and a half on a front porch at Petersburg, Virginia, in a building that still still exists. So, I mean, th those terms were suggested um, and inspired by, I think, Lincoln, there's no question. So what Lincoln places have you visited? Oh, God. Well, the, the front porch at Petersburg. Uh, clearly. Um, that's what uh, made me think of uh, asking you that. Richmond, um, I, I did a wonderful trip. There's a, there's a, there's a, a U.S. park ranger in Richmond who is one of the, took it upon himself to become an expert at Lincoln in Richmond, which is one of the most unbelievably cinematic moments in American history. I begin the book with it. It's at the heart of the book. Yeah, we should tell, you should tell that story. About sure. About April 4th, 1865. Yeah. Um, well, but, but just, to, you know, to give credit to this, this one fella, because we went and visited, and he had debunked a lot of uh, rumors and myths, and, and there's, you know, on some unreliable accounts, and so I walked with my son um, uh, and, and mother, actually, up from the river up to the top and the Capitol. And by the way, it's a very steep climb. You can see why Lincoln got, uh, Lincoln got sort of stopped to wipe his brow. But it, Lincoln and Richmond is one of these moments that get short shrift, even in multi-volume biographies. And there, it is so deep with resonance. I mean, the opening line of the book is, you know, Abraham Lincoln walked into the burning Confederate Capitol uphill from the river, passing abandoned slave markets on his right, uh, holding his son's, uh, Tad's hand uh, on the boy's 12th birthday. Um, Richmond had been abandoned less than two days before. It was still not fully secured by, by Union troops. Lincoln arrives on a longboat because his broke has broken down in a series of accidents, arrives basically unannounced. There's no military escort. There's, the city is not secured. And he wanders up with a very small troop holding his boy's hand, um, and he actually is first recognized by newly liberated slaves. Uh, and, and then he walks up and a crowd circles around him and he basically in almost an hour later bumps into the New York 54th Regiment, um, 51st Regiment, um, who bring him to conf the, the Confederate White House, Jefferson Davis's house. And he sits in Jefferson Davis's chair and looks out the same window. Uh, and, and it's just, it is so rich. All these little anecdotes. He passes a prisoner of um, a, 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 the Libby Prison, which had been a prisoner of war camp that now is hosting Confederates. Uh, and, and the mob yells at him, tear it down. And he says, no, leave it as a monument. Um, and, and, you know, it, 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 because his point is, you know, we can't erase our history. We need to confront it. We need to learn from it. Um, there's another amazing moment where Godfrey Weitzel, the 29-year-old German immigrant general who's overseeing the occupation of Richmond, uh, says to him as he's leaving uh, the town for the boat for the night so he can negotiate with Confederates the next day. He says, how should I treat the citizens of Richmond? And he said, well, I don't think we're going to be able to extinguish our resentments through hatred. If I were in your place, I'd let him up easy. Let him up easy. It's but just, just imagine, this is, I mean, we hear these kind of absurd suggestions that it would be safe or, or practical or useful for President Biden to go to Kiev. Um, Kiev? <laughs> just messing with you. I know. If your family was from Galicia, you can say it the old way. <laughs> um, Lincoln goes to, as you point out, an, un, an unsecured enemy capital um, before Appomattox. The war is still on. Yeah. Um, and th it is, there are supposedly white people in upper story windows looking, glaring down at him. Uh, it, and one sharpshooter. Yeah. And... It is a cinematic moment, and you know, having advised on the Lincoln film um, years a few years ago, the Spielberg film, I asked Tony Kushner why he didn't do it, why he didn't include it. He said, you know, people of color knelt to Lincoln, and he said, you must not kneel to me, you must kneel only to God, because he secured your freedom, not I. He said, it just, it's not acceptable today. So... It happened, according to several eyewitnesses. But in fact, hmm. the enslaved people of Richmond were effectively freed by Lincoln's arrival under the terms of the Emancipation Proclamation. They were still enslaved until ah. Lincoln entered the, the city. That's it was his only experience of personally liberating anyone, you know, because you didn't just snap your fingers and achieve 
emancipation. Soldiers, white and black, had to fight that. So I, I agree with you, and we'll never see it cinematically. But you describe it pretty cinematically, so that's good. Thank you. What did reconciliation on a grand scale mean to Lincoln in terms of not only of North and South, but of black and white? Well, you know, I, I think Lincoln was aiming towards what um, a, a peace negotiator who's legendary in some circles today named John Paul Lederach refers to as a horizon of reconciliation, which is something he's steering the nation to. It's a goal that you don't arrive at, but it gives you something to steer towards. And I think that goal in many respects was multiracial democracy. Now he knew it wouldn't happen quickly. He knew he wouldn't probably see it certainly in his presidency. And one of the lines in one of his um, uh, proclamation letters actually to uh, I believe the governor of Louisiana, he says that he hopes that over time blacks and whites will be able to live themselves out of their old arrangement with each other. Right, there's an understanding that things need to be seated, that real reconciliation needs to take place on the local level, I mean, between neighbors. Um, it is a matter of winning hearts and minds and will take time. And it's why the example of the black uh, Union soldiers was so important at, at you know, confronting and, uh, and destroying prejudice, even obviously in, in white communities that you know, were products of their time. Um, so, so Lincoln had this vision of it's gonna take time. It will take, you need to solidify the military gains, you need political reform to remove the root causes of the war, i.e. slavery. Um, you need economic expansion to give people something to look forward to. Uh, and then cultural reintegration, which is going to take time. And I think what's extraordinary about Lincoln's leadership is that he understood that the president's words matter. You know, I meditate extensively on the second inaugural, but also his actions matter. Uh, and, and that's what's so inspiring to me is the way that Lincoln in the last weeks of his life provides a sort of portrait of a peacemaker. One of my favorite stories in the book is uh, when he's, he's touring the Depot Field Hospital, which was a state-of-the-art military hospital uh, of its time in City Point. And he, there are hundreds and hundreds of beds, and he goes up to each wounded Union soldier and shakes their hands, and he asks them their story, as presidents do at Walter Reed today. And he's an emotional guy, and he, he is overcome with emotion, looking at the, the, just the, the, the cruel cost of the war. And, and he asks them their stories, and he is overwhelmed, but goes forward. He's getting ready to leave, and he sees a small tent out back. And he asks the surgeon who's touring him around, uh, who's kind of an imperious fellow trying to impress the president, as people do. Um, he asks him, what's that back there? And the fellow says, oh, that's nothing you need to worry about. Those are just wounded rebel soldiers. And Lincoln says, that's exactly where I do need to go. And he goes there, and he shakes all of theirs hands, and he asks their, their stories. And, and decades later, the stories, you know, one, one, one uh, Confederate colonel says, uh, the moment I, I looked into his eyes, I knew I was, I was done. And some of them broke down and cried because they realized they'd been fighting for a lie. They'd been told this man was a tyrant and a butcher, and they realized that he was a kind man who wanted his country to be able to live together again. And, and just that personal example is, is, is at least as powerful as his words and speeches, and he knew that. I'm always asked this next question. I hate answering it, so why not pass <laughs> it along to you? Give um, me that gift. Because yeah. you, call, um, you call Reconstruction what the star-spangled betrayal? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the failure of Reconstruction. Yeah, the failure of Reconstruction. Yeah. Um, so let's play counterfactual for a minute. Um, had Lincoln lived, what does he do di markedly differently than, than Johnson? And how does he handle a Congress that, in effect, wanted to move even more quickly and decisively than Lincoln was prepared to move in April 1865? The reason that he says he hates the question is that counterfactuals are, you know, you're immediately spiraling off into sort of, you know, good conversation over drinks, but you're, you know. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll because you asked, I'll play that game, but you need to root it in sort of what we know, right? So that, 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 that's the context that makes the conversation useful. So first of all, Lincoln is expecting that he will have more conflicts with the radical Republicans in his party. He recognizes that, um, that they wanna rip the South up from the roots and he, he thinks that you need to treat them, especially the, the rank and file, that you need to sort of treat them like people. Um, and one of his, his great powers, and I, I, I 
detail this in great length, is what I call the, 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 the politics of the golden rule. Treat other people as you'd like to be treated. Um, which sounds trite, but it's actually deeply profound, right? I mean, he says about slavery, you know, I, I know of no good thing that no man would want for himself. He also applies it to the Southerners after the war. And empathy, he has an ability to empathize with his opponents. He doesn't demonize people he disagrees with, even when they're calling for his death. One detail I loved was, um, in private, uh, he called Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee, uh, Jeffy D. and Bobby Lee. And it's, just, it's a little dismissive, but it's a reminder that this is a familial fight, right? Um, and and he's car he's, his, I think his personality is driven by honesty and humor and humility, moral humility. And the combination, I think, leads to, it's a balance of moderation and moral courage. But because he has this view, this empathy-driven view of how you deal with people, he doesn't want to believe you can rip the South up from the roots, which is almost sort of a, a utopian vision. We're going to remake society entirely. And he doesn't think that that's going to work. Right? <laughs> he thinks you're going to court a backlash. Um, I think knowing what we know, here's what we can say. First of all, there would have been conflicts with radicals who want to go further than or faster than he wants to go. I do think that where he would have drawn a line, a couple of basic places. He would never have let the Freedmen's Bureau be dismantled the way Johnson did. And the Freedmen's Bureau is actually a really fascinating organization. He signs into law on his second inauguration day which is an early sort of public-private partnership designed to uh, deal with refugees in the wake of the Civil War and, and help former slaves achieve self-sufficiency. Because remember, they'd also been denied education as a matter of state policy in the Confederacy and in the South. It's a massive effort. Johnson tries to dismantle it. Lincoln would have <laughs> absolutely supported it. The other thing I think Lincoln would have done based on what we know, while he was willing to be very federalist in his vision of reconstruction, he realized that each state was gonna have a little bit of a different tone and time and temper, and he's fixated on Louisiana in particular, I think because it's an example of, of a multiracial democracy that he's seen as a young man, um, however embryonic with the, with the Creole class, um, that, that he, the, the black codes are something he would have stepped in and stopped because that vi violates basic principles of fairness and equality under law. And he would have also, I think, insisted on the enforcement of the 13th and 14th and ultimately 15th amendments. Um, and so I think those are clear places where you can say where things would have been dramatically, meaningfully different, based on what we know. I think that's, that's fair. Okay. I'm always interested in, well, he picked Louisiana because it's kind of diverse within its white population, yeah. as you point out. And um, it was taken by the Union so early that emancipation was actually excluded in the parishes around New Orleans that were already occupied. I think also because Lincoln identified with Governor Hahn, who was Jewish and an outcast in his own way in Louisiana, somehow had ascended to the governorship. That's just a nice ecumenical aside no, no, in this, in this Passover story. season, right? True story. And Easter season. Um, before we go to your questions, and w we have an opportunity to go back to questions from the audience, which yeah. we haven't done for a couple of years, um, I do want to make the connection that Jennifer introduced in her introduction. Um, and that is, you spent a lot of time in the book, and I really was fascinated by it, because I've done talks about how other presidents have dealt with the Lincoln legacy and have all been, regardless of party, admirers, Republicans, Democrats, Wilson, Taft, Roosevelt. 1912 was an election Roosevelt. of both Roosevelt, but in 1912, all three candidates for president were fighting for the mantle of Lincoln by doing various public events related to Lincoln. So specifically in your story, and you spend you know at least one chapter on this, presidents who got us into and out of wars, and I'm not criticizing them, you know, Starting with particularly Wilson and Roosevelt. Let's start with Wilson. How did they apply these Lincolnian precepts of creating peace? Sure. So remember first I said that Lincoln's broad prescription for winning the peace is unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. Right? Now, why unconditional surrender? When he's negotiating with Confederates, which he does on at least two occasions, one on the River Queen and Hampton Roads Peace Conference where he walks away, and another in Richmond, he writes in his own hands what he calls the three indispensable conditions for peace, right? One is a resumption of the federal union, an exception of fe uh, acceptance of federal authority, and implicitly 
a renunciation of any alleged right to secession, which he calls the essence of anarchy. The second is an end to slavery for all time. And one of the fascinating things is that's a foregone conclusion by the time Appomattox rolls around. It's actually assumed. Um, now, the 13th Amendment's already passed. But the third thing is the surprising one. No ceasefire before surrender. And this is what causes, in many respects, the Hampton Roads Peace Conference to blow up. Because he gets floated these crazy ideas. One of them, one of them <laughs> blew my mind, which is uh, the, the, one of the uh, Confederate senators there suggested that the North and South reunite uh, to attack Mexico and dislodge Emperor Maximilian in this like muscular defense of the Monroe Doctrine, and that that shared conflict against a mutual enemy will reunite the nation, and they can work out all the details later. Um, now, there are a number of problems with this, right? One of which is that if you're going to have a truce, it would, it, would, it, it would involve acknowledging the sovereignty of, of the southern states, which he's never going to do. Um, but more importantly, the reason he refuses to have a ceasefire before surrender is that he understands that in that negotiation period, the political will to end slavery will evaporate, right? That peace at any price is too expensive if you don't remove the root cause. One famous quote, he says, no man desires peace more than I, but I am unwilling to have a peace if secured on such terms that it would guarantee further bloodshed. And, and so this is a profound point because it would have been very popular to have a ceasefire, stop the, stop the fighting, stop the bloodshed, stop the killing, but he refuses to do it. Fast forward to Woodrow Wilson in, in you know, the run up to World War I. First of all, he's the first president from the South since the Civil War. He is a child of the Confederacy and Reconstruction. He has suffered those pains and has those resentments. Um, and, and, and so when he becomes president, he not only brings his sort of, you know, the bigotry that he inherits from his father, who, by the way, was famous in part for writing a, a, a pamphlet uh, coming up with a biblical defense of slavery and, and resegregates the federal government to his eternal discredit. But when he gets drawn into World War I, the speech he gives to Congress says, we need a peace without victory, a peace among equals. And it's not too hard to see that the young boy's experience in Reconstruction reflected in that vision of how you can end war. It's, we're going to not have any resentment. When the U.S. gets involved, it decidedly tips the balance of power. But critically, there is a ceasefire before surrender. Armistice. The Germans don't surrender. There's not any allied troops on German soil. They don't accept defeat. And this creates a fundamental problem that plays out over the course of the negotiations at Versailles, where then over time you get a, a, the worst of both worlds, right? You get no, there's not surrender, or ceasefire, there's a, s a ceasefire before surrender, and then instead of a magnanimous peace, there are punishing reparations that Germany doesn't have the ability to repay, and the terms are harsh, but the Allies don't have the will to enforce them. This is the worst of all worlds, and that incubates a whole lost cause mythology uh, that ends up taking root around Adolf Hitler and the rise of the Nazi party. So it is the worst of all worlds. It's the opposite of Lincoln's prescription, unconditional surrender, magnanimous peace. Now, when the World War II generation rises up, and they are the grandchildren of the Civil War, and they can feel uh, the, the recognition of, of, of the resentments and the family scars that still exist, one of the things that, that FDR says at the night after Pearl Harbor, this time we're going to win the peace. The official policy is unconditional surrender. FDR and Churchill to go out to Casablanca, and they come up, and they have a policy of unconditional surrender. And it's controversial at the time. And J uh, FDR explains it in a press conference with the Stephen Early. The I think I, I have the Okay. I'll I let you. I this, is, this is the quote. This is the, the transcript of the press conference. Right. We don't, Link by the way, you probably, you can be forgiven because you probably don't know, but we don't like to talk about the Casablanca uh, conference because Roosevelt was supposed to come to Hunter College and officially present this house to Hunter College, and he snuck off to Casablanca for no good reason. No, yeah, we had a good reason, <laughs> and left it to Eleanor, which was not a bad substitute, but it's, it, it hurts. It hurts. All these okay. years later. All right. All these years later. Okay. Can this is Roosevelt um, in the presence of, of Stephen Early, who is a collateral descendant of Jubal Early, which is one reason why um, there were no black journalists at any Roosevelt press conference until 1944. 12, 12 years with 
all white press conferences. And it's not that there weren't efforts. I just want to throw that in. Um, okay, this is Roosevelt on uh, his version of the end of the Civil War. There has been a good deal of complaint among some of the nice, high-minded people about unconditional surrender, says Roosevelt. They complain that it's too tough and too rough. Well, I'll explain it a little this way. Back in 1865, Lee was driven into a corner back of Richmond at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, and then uh, Roosevelt gives his version of the end of the Civil War, and Lee relented. All right, I surrender, Roosevelt re re portrays Lee as saying, and tendered a sword to Grant, which he didn't do. Grant said, Bob, put it back. Oh, I see. Now, do you unconditionally surrender? This is like Trump telling a story, yeah, by the way. It's very right. circular kind of. Yes. Then Grant said, you're my prisoners now. Do you need food for your men? Lee says, yes, I haven't got more than enough for one meal. Then Grant said, now about those horses that belong to the Confederate officers, tell your officers to take them. That's unconditional surrender, says. It's great. He knows a lot, clearly. Yeah. And, and, but it's also just a reminder of how close the Civil War was in their psyche and how much they're riffing off it. Um, I mean, th literally, the example he uses to explain a policy of unconditional surrender is his retelling of uh, Appomattox. It is close. I mean, I was thinking this morning, <laughs> those of us who were around and remember, as I do vaguely, the mid-50s, between the mid-50s and now is the same s expanse of time as between... Appomattox and the inauguration of Franklin Roosevelt. So there is memory there. There are survivors. There are veterans, not just children and grandchildren. There are still surviving veterans, really until 1960. Th that's right. No, and 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 even when when Truman takes over, you know, he reflects when he's at Pots, the Potsdam Conference and he's touring Germany and they're coming up with the plans. I mean, he he reflects on says, you know, I don't want hatred and resentment to be this generation's gift to the next because he re recollects how much his parents and grandparents hated Lincoln and hated the, the, the Union. I mean, his mother refused to sleep in the Lincoln bedroom. <laughs> I, there, there, was, there was real bad blood, so they're, they're drawing on this. And then, of course, the Marshall Plan, which is done in conjunction with Senator Vandenberg, a Republican, and, and Secretary of State Marshall, is the opposite of reparations. Right? It's an investment in peace, and it's sold to the American people in a bipartisan way, so it's the exact opposite. Of, of what happens at Versailles quite intentionally. Just let's say one works. word about uh, MacArthur and give him sure. some acknowledgement because he is actually also demanding unconditional surrender and also leaving the emperor in place. Do you point out how the bust of Lincoln in his... I that, isn't that, that a cool detail? It is pretty Here, he, cool. Emperor Hirohito <laughs> had a bust of Lincoln in his office next to Charles Darwin and, and, and uh, Napoleon before, during, and after the war. And, and one of the things, there's a great book called The Global Lincoln by Jay Sexton and um, I'm forgetting, maybe Michael Ledeen, maybe, uh, co-editor, uh, where they talk about Lincoln's legacy overseas. And one of the things in Japan, Lincoln was a revered figure in the 1930s and 20s. H his life story was taught for its moral values to school children as part of an official curriculum. And so Lincoln's example is something that MacArthur can draw upon to sell the idea of, of democracy because there's already sort of a synaptic foothold in 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 the culture, uh, and and it's just an extraordinary. You know, we see that pattern again and again. By the way, there was a Tokyo Lincoln Center. Yes. Led for years by a man who lived to be about 108. Does it not exist anymore? I don't know. I visited I think it, it does. once when I went to Japan. But there were all you know he, uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek admired Lincoln hugely. Uh, Gandhi and Nehru both. So there is that global. Um, reverence. So let me ask you something as a final question, and then we'll circulate the microphone. Hope you all aren't too tight on time because we're just having fun here. But we'll we'll, we'll get <laughs> to your questions. One final question: um, Lincoln's reputation is under um, review. Let's say now he is being, um, in some ways, analyzed under 21st century rules and mores, and perhaps as some people think, subjected to criticism that's a little bit unfair. Where do you think Lincoln's reputation should stand? I think I know from reading the book. But how, how is, it, is there a way to, re, to reinvigorate his reputation? And does he deserve the reinvigoration? Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, and I consider his reputation fairly invigorated, but clearly my book in part is a case for why uh, Lincoln deserves his place um, at the, the top of the American pyramid, as it were. 
And, and I, what I think is essential to understand is that among his contemporaries, it was his goodness that really, that really solidified his greatness. One of the things Lincoln does for us is he reminds us that kindness can be consistent with effective leadership. And I don't think that's a lesson we can learn enough or see too many examples of. Um, and, 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 and that's why, I mean, just the man's fundamental decency, his reliance on empathy and humor and moral humility, his combination of morality, uh, moral courage and moderation is, is retains the force of revelation because it is so rare to see that in a president and a leader. But I think that's why um, he endures. That's why he had these ac acolytes who went out and, and, and kept telling the story of Lincoln uh, in, in real time. Look, history is a debate that never ends. And part of our responsibility is to make the old stories new again. And we should constantly be stepping back and trying to create a, a broader aperture. You know, when we see that figures have been written out of history or their roles underappreciated, um, then we should, we should take that all into account. It's something I try to do in the book. There's a, a brilliant writer and journalist named Thomas Morris Chester who is a character in the book who deserves much more recognition today. The role of black Union soldiers, their essential role in turning the tide of the war deserves much more respect and attention than it gets today. The whole story of, of, of Reconstruction um, and, and the, the roles that people play in, in that brief <laughs> burst of multiracial democracy, which was snuffed out and, and, and subverted. Um, but I think what, what is essential to appreciate is, look, we're going to have these, these debates. It is always a mistake to apply purely contemporary standards upon people in the past, because they're always going to fall short. Um, and, and, and I think that needs to be done with a spirit of, of moral humility on our part. You know. We have things we can learn from the past, and we desperately depend, particularly in our democracy, on shared stories. We, I think, we can, we live in a time, understandably, where people are knocking a lot of figures off pedestals, and we can look at the cult of Robert E. Lee, for example, as something that was misplaced. Maybe it was, you know, you can understand why it was, it was societally useful for a time. We can engage in debates about Confederate statues, but let's be real and say there is no moral equivalence between a statue of a Confederate <laughs> general and a statue of Abraham Lincoln. Now, perfect's not on the menu, but this guy was a single issue candidate his entire career, you know, from when he ran for the Senate. Um, and, and he had the capacity for, for growth. But, you know, if you want to debate his position on abolition, I'll, I'll refer to Frederick Douglass, who says, seen from a genuine abolition perspective, he could seem tardy, cool, and indifferent. But seen from the perspective of a politician, a statesman who was bound by his oath to consult his constituents, he was zealous, determined, and radical. That's that balance. And, and, and so, by all means, let's engage in the debate, but let's not come up with false moral equivalencies or create impossible standards. I'll just read you one quote, the epigraph of the book, because it sums up, I think, the spirit of all of this for me, applied history, but also the genius of Lincoln. And it's not a well-known Lincoln quote, but it's my favorite. He says this the night after he wins re-election. He says, human nature will not change. In any future great national trial compared with men of this, we shall have as weak and as strong, as silly and as wise, as bad and is good. Let us therefore study the incidents of this as philosophy to learn wisdom from, and none of them as wrongs to be revenged. That, I think, is exactly the right spirit to study our history, with taking people off pedestals, understanding them as imperfect humans because it makes them more interesting, making their wisdom more accessible, and then trying to learn the lessons of history as philosophies to learn wisdom with, and not as wrongs to be revenged. I think that lens, to my mind and heart, from the lips of Lincoln is the right one to, to judge our history. Great ending. Thank you, there John. You <laughs> now we get to have a conversation even more. OK, sir.
I'm Michael Myers. Oh, hey, Michael. President of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. How I you got doing? my mask off. I didn't recognize you. I know. But, uh, <laughs> I, I got four Good masks to see you. on. <laughs> I got four masks. My question is to you is about the American character. Mm -hmm. um, we had, right after Lincoln's death, radical Republicans who were dis, dis, disabused of their power. Mm -hmm. They lost their power. They lost their moral influence over the nation. And then shortly after that, you had a nation that came back to pre-Lincoln, people who had massive resistance to the notion of integration. Mm -hmm. And you had not just that, you had interposition and nullification of civil rights laws mm -hmm. that were passed mm -hmm. after Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment didn't really do what Lincoln expected the constitutional amendments would do. So my question to you is, given the history and given the, the power of the American psyche, segregationist psyche, mm -hmm. racist psyche, and despite and in, in spite of Lincoln's efforts to disabuse the nation of racism, let's take that as granted. How do we define the American character that keeps coming back to segregation and enforce segregation and dismissing the civil rights laws and amendments that were passed in the interest of blacks? It's a great and important question. First of all, I think by recognizing that race is at the center of the American story, and it has been from our beginning. Um, and that's why we need to study our history. Now, that doesn't mean we need to denigrate America or, 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 or say that you know, it is irredeemable and, and at all. In fact, I think quite the opposite. I think the American experiment is worth honoring because of our progress towards a more perfect union, something we never arrive at, that is fitful. And that's why we need to learn particularly about the times when we backslide. And when, if, you, if you keep those two things in mind, you'll see, I think, how critical it is to understand the massive resistance, as you said, which is a, obviously a quote from uh, you know, anti-integration efforts in the 1960s, but could apply to Reconstruction as well. Whenever the prospect of multiracial democracy, which is a fruition of that idea of a more perfect union, there is resistance, often violent resistance, to its pursuit. And at the same time, that is also true of a majoritarian democracy. If you go back and, and you look at, at the, the aggressive defensiveness and the tactics that are used in the run-up to civil war by elites posing as populists, trying to sort of manipulate a political system to get disproportionate power, secure their power, and similar patterns, almost very similar patterns, exercised during Reconstruction in an attempt to claw back that power in, in the states. You, you understand then that, no, even a constitutional amendment is not enough to secure those hard-won gains. Doesn't mean anything if it isn't enforced. Which is why then I think we need to also learn the story of when, when Ulysses S. Grant uh, went up to Congress personally to lobby for the passage of the Anti-KKK Enforcement Act in 1870 and 1871, and then had it implemented by a Southern Attorney General and had the top echelon of that early incarnation of the KKK sent up to prison at Albany. And it basically, I mean, it wasn't the end of certainly white vigilante groups in the South, but the KKK as an institution went, at, w was, went virtually extinct until the 1920s when they reemerged in reaction to waves of immigration. So I, I think the, the answer is to keep in mind, it's not a fault in the American character. I mean, I think our country represents the human <laughs> character and all its strengths and weaknesses because we are an experiment in, in multi-ethnic and multi-racial democracy. But we make fitful progress towards these things, and when we make progress, there's often a pushback. And so that's why I think history can help us get perspective on that, and help us maybe steady us, give us something to guide us when those waves and those pendulum swings start to happen. I don't think it's a problem in the American character, but it's absolutely a case for understanding our history and applying its lessons to our problems today. Thank you. Uh, great, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I was waiting, and I just heard it about a minute ago, uh, when we're talking about <coughs> Reconstruction, not so much Lincoln, uh, to hear a word or two about Grant, mm -hmm. whose historical reputation has uh, been significantly enhanced in uh, recent years. 
And uh, I learned in school uh, that uh, Reconstruction uh, began uh, with the compromise that brought Hayes to the presidency in exchange for withdrawal of troops from the South. So Grant had a role to play in what was supposed to be Reconstruction. I'd like to hear more about it. Well, I, I think Grant uh, deserves a lot more credit than he has, I think, historically gotten um, for what he did to get the nation back on the Lincoln path after the presidency of Andrew Johnson. I think the Ron Chernow biography does a, a, a great service to us in this direction. But I think it's interesting to think about the, the, the history of Reconstruction that many folks were taught in schools growing up. And to reflect for a second how it really was an echo of the vision of Reconstruction presented in the movie Birth of a Nation, where the failures of Reconstruction were primarily the fault of radical Republicans. And you'll never know the chaos that existed when all of a sudden there were blacks in state legislatures, particularly in the South. Um, Grant actively played a role. One of the things he says in his inaugural address is we need to pass the 15th Amendment, right, which is, is voting rights. He insists on the passage of, um, of, of the Enforcement Act to beat back the KKK. Um, and what really pushes us back, ultimately, because we're making fitful progress. I mean, we had, we had you know, African-American elected officials all throughout the country, well, in the South predominantly, who are Republican. And part of the cautionary tale there is when all of a sudden race becomes a, a, an issue of political polarization. Um, but when the, the depression of 1873 kicks in, everybody turns inward. And, and the, the enthusiasm for enforcing Reconstruction and making progress towards real racial reconciliation consistent with the ideals of emancipation goes by the wayside. Democrats reemerge, um, aided by the fact that they'd gotten amnesty by, by um, the whole bunch of them got an amnesty under Andrew Johnson. They reconstitute as a group called the Redeemers, and they are pushing to cut taxes and cut budgets in the post-war South despite the deep need to rebuild, in part because they want to defund integrated public institutions. And, and then the process, once that corrupt bargain is put in place in 1876, which is negotiated, by the way, at the Wormsley Hotel, which is owned by a black philanthropist uh, named Jacob Wormsley, um, that deal is done. Hayes feels sort of, you know, there's not much he can do about it because he doesn't have full control of Congress. And then it's a process of 25 years of, of an erosion of rights solidified with ex-Confederates on courts um, that do things like r refuse to apply civil, you know, they, they, they say civil rights laws are unconstitutional. They say the Colfax massacre is not a matter for uh, the, 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 the federal government to, you know, take, take part in. And, and then there are state constitutional conventions. The most chilling example that uh, I find is in, uh, in 1900, there are 180,000 180, registered black voters in the state of Alabama. Two years later, there are 3,000. So, it, you know, Grant deserves much more credit than he gets because he has Lincoln's advice in mind, right? He's campaigning on let us have peace, but he's not going to backtrack from his commitments to, to bringing, you know, the formerly enslaved Americans into the fold, and but then the political will erodes in part because of a depression, and the way the systemic process by which, part of which is voter intimidation, voter subversion, uh, you know, election subversion uh, that takes place is, is a cautionary tale, but it takes place over decades. But Grant actually, I think, deserves far more credit than he gets, and I think Chernow helped make that case for us. I think we're going to do one more question two more, because, two more. well, we need to get upstairs. Uh, oh, we do. Our and you need to sign some books. I'm sorry. I'm just And these fun folks need some wine. So who's? All right, right here. Wait I'll for the mic, for because we need our. Zoom I'll answer audience. all your questions upstairs. If right. You don't get to <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Based on your research, what, what was Lincoln's view on integration? I know he was the last proponent of voluntary repatriation to, uh, of African Americans to Africa and Central America. Do you think his view was that we'd have uh, true integration, or was that not part of his worldview? Well, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, Henry Clay came up with these ideas of these sort of, you know, who was his political idol as a Whig back, you know, when that was his party. Um, 
with the idea that you needed this sort of off-ramp or repatri repatriation. And it, one of the interesting things, I mentioned Thomas Morris Chester in passing. He was a um, brilliant uh, young guy from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and he actually became the editor of the Star of Liberia newspaper in Monrovia um, in, 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 uh, in Liberia. He participated in that. Um, Lincoln sort of ended up not thinking that was practical or ideal or feasible, as many people did, including Thomas Morris Chester, who came back initially with the goal of building a militia to fight in the war, which he was denied permission for on this by the governor of Philadelphia, so became a reporter instead. Um, I, I, I think you know one, there, there, are, there are a lot of accounts of Lincoln being particularly bemused when he sees biracial children of, of Southerners, um, because I think what it reminds him of is the, the essential human frailty of it. Um, that you know, that this is a this is a corrupt and unworkable system, uh, and I think just by 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 looking at his comments in in the debates with Douglas, you know, there's that one speech he gives in the southern part of the state that people you know bash him around the head and neck for, um, but I think if you look at his comments, he says it's it's I believe that the blacks and whites need to gradually live themselves out of their old arrangement with each other. The role of Elizabeth Keckley in the Lincoln family, who's a biracial free uh, freed slave who owns a, a business and is the first lady's seamstress, but actually runs a business. Um, uh, you know, she is, she is the person that, that uh, Mary calls for uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of Lincoln's assassination. Um, in some respects, uh, while white supremacy is baked in the cake <laughs> in terms of that worldview at that time, let's not dis disabuse ourselves of that, uh, there are examples, um, whether it's Lincoln and, and Douglas's relationship, and you know, calling in Douglas to ask his reaction to the second inaugural address, uh, to the presence of Elizabeth Keckley, to the presence of, of black Union soldiers, and on and on and on, in, in Lincoln's circle and beyond, um, that I think you could have the moral imagination to say when we that it is his hope that blacks and whites will gradually live themselves out of their old arrangement with each other, that that is a vision of a more integrated society that reflects who we really are, and the aberration is the cruel institution of slavery. That's the aberration, the core contradiction with the Declaration of Independence. That's the core contradiction with the vision of free labor um, that Lincoln held. Um, so I think that was the aberration, not the idea of a more integrated America over time. Well, let, let's, um, let's adjourn and thank John Avalon. Thank you. A lot of fun to be back. And let's continue the discussion over a glass of wine upstairs.